no intentions of taking steroids or doing drugs or drinking anymore. And you know, six months after working out, I was like 295 and strong. And, and that's when I, and, and you know, through working, um, you know, steps in a 12 step program, one of those things is, you know, to make amends, I thought, you know, maybe I could come back to plays and kind of keep my mouth shut and just do my job, you know, do what I'm asked to do and, and, and get paid for doing what I'm you know, supposed to do and not be a distraction. Tony Mandrich has lived two lives. The first one, every football fan in the 1980s knows about. Star offensive tackle for Michigan State. Number two pick in the 1989 draft by the Packers. Sports Illustrated cover boy, the steroids. That first life came crashing down on Mandrich and he was out of the league after four up and down seasons. The second life most people have heard little about, the drug and alcohol rehab after he left the Packers, the unlikely return to play three productive seasons for the Colts, clean from chemicals and focused on making amends for his first NFL stint, and a satisfying post-playing days career as a photographer and creative. Tony Mandrich's story is unlike any we have told before on this podcast series. One million boys play high school football every year in America, and only about 300 players are drafted by teams to the NFL annually. Those are some seriously long odds. On this show, we'll tell you about the amazing people that have beat the odds to make it at the highest level. Tony Mandrich was born in 1966 to immigrant parents from Yugoslavia. His parents grew up with limited resources in the post-World War II communist country. His father was a large man, but not the mountainous one that Tony would become. Tony's father completed his compulsory military service and met his mother, who was taken out of school in third grade to help the family tend their sheep. His mother's family gifted Tony his massive size. Her brothers were all six foot five or taller. The couple's first child was a daughter born in Yugoslavia in the 1950s. She was diagnosed with spinal meningitis when she was an infant, and the Mandrich family did not have the money for quality medical care in a corrupt health care system. She died before her first birthday. The Mandrishes decided they needed to get to North America to make a better life for the family they hoped to build. They escaped Yugoslavia and made their way to a refugee camp in Austria before relocating to Canada in 1955 to join family in a suburb of Toronto. When they stepped on foot in Canada, um, they knew like very, very little English. I would say less than 5%. So it was, you could almost say that they did not know English, um, but they figured it out, right? I remember my mom saying she stepped off the boat um, and she had like a skirt that went down to her knees and it was January and it was brutally, you know, cold right off the ocean there and not knowing a word of English and not having a dollar in their pocket. Mandrich's father found work as a lumberjack, and his older brother John was born in 1961. Tony came along five years later. His parents' resilience and ability to get out of a terrible situation in Eastern Europe instilled in Mandrich a belief that anything was possible. Thinking about what my parents did, you know, what I'm about to do paled in comparison to what they did. So I knew it was possible, and, and I knew I could do it, Mandrich described himself as an average student, but one who performed better on subjects he found engaging. As a good youth athlete, Mandrich focused mostly on soccer, which was popular with the immigrant population in Canada. He credits a long youth soccer career for improving his balance and footwork. However, the sport dominating the American airwaves held his attention in those days. The dream to play in the NFL was actually put on paper at, when I was 11. Um, I wanted to play in the NFL and that was, you know, at, at 11 years old, I mean, you're not even in high school until you're 14 or 15. So all I was playing was neighborhood football and then I was glued to the TV all day Saturday, all day Sunday. While the dream to play in the NFL started young, Mandrich didn't play Pop Warner or middle school football. He first put on the pads in high school in Oakville, Canada. My first football that I played with equipment and a helmet was my freshman year of high school. In, in Canada. And so, you know, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade uh, was at White Oaks High School in Oakville. The U.S. college football programs were not actively recruiting in Canada in the 1980s, but Tony's older brother, John, had gotten noticed at a high school football camp in Toronto. He went to Kent State in Ohio to play college football while the younger Tony was finishing up middle school. 
the brothers came up with an idea to get Tony an opportunity to play big-time college football himself. They convinced their parents to let Tony move to Kent, Ohio, to live with his brother for his senior year of high school. The boys felt this was Tony's best chance to live out his dream. He had to become my legal guardian. Um, by law. So, and it was Christmas, it was at Christmas time, you know, five, six months before I went down there for my senior year, where we had the discussion of, you know, they're just not recruiting up here. And if my dream is to play, this is what we think my brother and I thought was the best potential for me to come down there, play at the local high school there, try to get some exposure. And, and if I'm good enough and, and, and get lucky and get a chance to get uh, noticed, get a, get a scholarship offer. His parents agreed, and Tony moved to Kent to live with his older brother. At that time, in the mid-1980s, Ohio was a hotbed of football in America, and Kent Roosevelt High had a quality program. It was a huge change for Mandarich. I went from my high school in Canada, we had bleachers that held like 20 people, to a high school stadium that held 10,000. And it was like jaw dropping. It was so exciting and, and, and it was phenomenal. But the experience was awesome. And uh, they took, we played in a very good league. And the great thing for me was there was four players on our team that were being nationally recruited uh, for scholarships and, and had offers to a lot of different schools. So a lot of these scouts were coming to the games to look at them and then, you know, my head coach, uh, John Nemec, obviously had said, hey, also take a look at this guy. He's, he came down from Canada pretty much for the sole purpose to, you know, finish his education, graduate from high school, but really to get exposure to play football. So take a look at him. Mandrich quickly excelled in the new environment and became a star on the offensive line for Roosevelt High. The scholarship offer started rolling in. Mandarich chose Michigan State, where he was recruited by a hardworking defensive coach, Nick Saban, now the superstar head coach at Alabama. Mandarich had grown to six foot six and reached 280 pounds, but the transition to Michigan State was still jarring. It was a big shock because they were a lot um, stronger uh, and the game was faster. I mean, but the, the size and strength of the people was probably the biggest thing. And, and uh, the game was faster than high school, definitely. Uh, the, there, there was a moment when we played Notre Dame. It was the third game of the year. We played Notre Dame at Michigan State. And I saw, you know, Mark Bavaro, who was the tight end, who ended up having a great career with the Giants. When I saw the size of that guy, I was like, holy smokes. And, you know, he was a tight end. I was a tackle. And that was, you know, that was my red shirt year. Uh, and, and he was bigger than I was. And I thought, man, I need to get myself in gear and start working out harder and, and doing all these things. And if, if I, if I plan to make it to the next level. Mandridge determined that to get bigger and faster, he would have to turn to steroids. This was a different era, and steroids were more prominent at the college level, and testing was not as sophisticated as today. Even still, Mandridge knows now it was a mistake, and he often speaks to high school players about the dangers of steroid use. Here is what he had to say on the subject. I, I mean, I took steroids. Um, I felt that, I honestly felt that to make it to the NFL at like a lineman position, whether it was offensive or defensive, for the most part, you had to take them. Uh, and, and there was a lot of teams that were taking them at that time, but that's still no excuse. At the end of the day, I make the final decision for myself. Um, so I did take them and, you know, I did get bigger and, and, and stronger and I got faster. Um, does that make you a better football player? I don't know. I don't know. Mandridge got bigger, and he also got better, much better. Mandridge grew to 330 pounds of muscle and dominated the Big Ten. He was named an All-American and won numerous awards. He says his favorite memory of his time in East Lansing was the game his senior year against Indiana that locked up the Spartans' trip to the Rose Bowl. Michigan State had not been back to the Rose Bowl since the year I was born. So it was 25 years, so or it was 20 years or whatever it was. But I had... Um, thought to myself like what an incredible moment and then when we we and we knew kind of we were going to win because Indiana was a very very good team but we were just it was just our time I guess if you if you want to say like we were smash mouth football and uh and they were coming into our place 
And, you know, we, we did beat them 27 to three and they were a great team, but you know, the fans rush the field, they tear down the goalposts and it's like, Oh my God, this is the stuff I would watch when I was a kid. So that experience was to me, one of the most exciting experiences I ever had in football period, like to this day. Um, that was one of the best moments, funnest times I'd, I'd ever had. In the spring of 1989, it was time for the NFL draft, and Mandrich was considered one of the top prospects in the country. Sports Illustrated memorialized Mandrich in one of its most famous covers, shirtless and looking like a superhero. They dubbed Mandrich the incredible bulk and proclaimed him the top offensive line prospect ever. That cover was like one of the top three sellers of the decade of the 80s. Um, so, I, and you know, I, you know, interesting phenomenon happen and all these interesting side effects happen that you just like come out of nowhere. And I can't tell you how many times people have told me this. They said, you know, I remember, you know, when you were on the cover of Sports Illustrated because I would, I took your cover and I taped it to the inside of my high school locker. I have had thousands of people tell me that. It was widely expected that quarterback Troy Aikman would be selected first, but Mandrich was a strong possibility to go second to the Green Bay Packers. Mandrich at this time had built a larger-than-life persona, one that he didn't think would thrive with a small market team in Wisconsin. He publicly trashed the Packers and told them not to pick him in the draft. I wanted to be in a big market, meaning big market meaning you know a big city where there's going to be more opportunity for sponsorship promotions in addition to you know, having a job playing for an NFL team. Um, I, I felt that, you know, Green Bay, as much tradition as they had and have, um, was a small town. Uh, and probably the biggest factor was my, literally my ignorance. The Packers picked Mandrich anyways with the second pick, and he eventually signed with the team. Mandrich knew that the NFL had a much stronger steroid testing program than college football, so he says he stopped taking them before reporting to Green Bay. However, Mandrich started down a worse path toward a serious addiction to alcohol and drugs. While he was an off-and-on starter for the Packers, he never established himself as a top player. The hype machine that he had created in college turned on him hard. In 1992, Sports Illustrated put a very different-looking picture of Tony Mandrich on the cover with the snide headline, The Incredible Bust. Mandrich was not re-signed by the Packers following the 92 season, but what people didn't know was that he had fallen deep down an addiction hole falling off the cliff again and and just diving deep into the addiction had you know had a real severe concussion and all those side effects of not just from the concussion but just the side effects of alcoholism the traits of alcoholism isolating just all those you know depression all these other things you know numbing my feelings and numbing my emotions with you know a, a pill or a drink or whatever it was to get away from reality. And unfortunately, things got worse for Mandrich that year. His older brother, John, developed skin cancer that exacted the ultimate toll. My brother got sick uh, right, in, right in my last year in Green Bay uh, that year. Uh, he had gotten sick, got diagnosed with um, uh, skin cancer, and they thought they had caught it early enough and and, you know, from diagnosis to death was 14 months. I was out of the league for a month. Like, Green Bay did not resign me. And so it was January of 93. And, and then my brother died February 8th of 93. Um, you know, and I was like, you know, why do all these bad things keep happening to me? You know, and I, uh, I just kept dig going deeper and deeper into the addiction. Mandrich had finally hit rock bottom. He knew he needed help to get his life in order. He entered drug and alcohol rehab at a facility in Brighton, Michigan. I was tired of making excuses. I was tired of lying. I was tired of cheating. I was tired of doing all those things that are not of good character. And, uh, and, and I got sick and tired of myself. Mandrich emerged from rehab and started to rebuild his life. He says he dropped down to 255 pounds and was beaten up emotionally, spiritually, physically from all the chemicals he had put into his body. Always a big fan of lifting weights, Mandrich got back into the gym and started to see positive results. 
I was just like, I'm going to work out just for general health and it's, it's not going to hurt my sobriety. Um, I have no intentions of taking steroids or doing drugs or drinking anymore. And, you know, six months after working out, I was like 295 and strong. And, and that's when I, and, and, you know, through working, um, you know, steps in a 12 step program, one of those things is, you know, to make amends and, and try to make some, you know, try to make some of the wrongs, right. I thought, you know, maybe I could come back to play and if somebody gives me a chance and kind of keep my mouth shut and just do my job you know, do what I'm asked to do and, and, and get paid for doing what I'm, you know, supposed to do and not be a distraction and try to be an asset to the team. Mandrich reached out to his former agent, and came clean on where he had been the last few years. He shared the details of his struggles with drug and alcohol while playing with the Packers and his hard work to get clean and sober. His agent was skeptical at first, but became convinced Mandrich had a real shot at a comeback. Tryouts were set with the Eagles and then the Colts. I told I told him everything told him the truth about everything and he's like you know he made some calls and I I got a workout with uh Philadelphia first I was grateful to go down to Indy and I was lucky to get even an opportunity and and I went down to Indy had the workout had a very good workout and you know they offered um a two-year deal Mandrich knew that from a football perspective he had only upside in trying to prove himself on the field again his concern was more about the potential effects on his hard-won sobriety. I was already a bust. I had, nothing's expected of me. I've been out of the league three years. Um, really, nobody knew about the addiction. So everybody assumed the steroids, which they were right. But I you know, never took a steroid after college. And it was, it was one of those, I really felt like I had nothing to lose. Like I had nowhere to go but up. I'm going back into that arena of where all my drinking and drugs were and, and it's easier to get things. It doesn't matter if it's pills, you have access to so much more. And, um, and it was basically told to me or shared with me by some of these people that I really looked up to of, you know, if your foundation is strong and you surround yourself with the right people, you'll be fine. Mandarich miraculously returned to the NFL in 1996 after three seasons out of the league. We were playing, we were, op it was the NFL opener. We were playing the Arizona Cardinals. I, at that time, I think they were called the Phoenix Cardinals. Uh, and during the national anthem, uh, and it was like, I was almost 18 months sober. It was September. And I was like, it was surreal. It was surreal. It was like, is this, actually happening because 18 months ago I couldn't get off the couch. He played three productive seasons with the Colts. He did exactly what he said he would do. He kept his mouth shut and was a good teammate. A shoulder injury in 1998 ended his football career for good this time. So I knew it was time and and to retire and I felt that I had made my kind of quiet amends of I went back, I played, I gave that gave that organization everything I had. And, and I felt good about it. And I was grateful that I had the opportunity and it was really good closure for me. Um, you know, and, and I did, and I proved to myself, I could do it. I could be a starter and I could play well. I no, I didn't play at the pro bowl level, but I played well and I played for, you know, a great team. Over the next five years, Mandrich worked on finding a second career to throw his energy into. He worked for a time at Morgan Stanley and then helped with a family-run golf course. Later, he decided to pursue a career on the creative side, something he had interest in since his youth. I moved down to Arizona. That was in 2004, 2005. Um, and um, I was you know, married to Char, my second wife. And uh, we had... We went down and, and really were with the intentions of starting a photography business. Um, it ended up morphing into a business of kind of like a quote unquote media company where it was like web design, um, uh, SEO marketing, you know, paid search, all those things. 
Outside of his work in photography, Mandrix has a strong desire to share his story to help other people that might be struggling with drug or alcohol addiction or otherwise facing challenges in their lives. In 2009, he published a book about his life and worked with Inside the NFL on a documentary. When the book came out, it really was raw and it was an easy read. And it was raw and it really told the real story because a lot of people just defaulted to steroids. And they were like, that was just the, that was it. Not many people knew about the, the alcohol and the painkillers and the other substances. So I knew like my two biggest things were, um, it, you know, I'm, nobody can get thrown under the bus and it's got to help somebody at the end of the day. It, it could be a soccer mom. It could be anybody because you don't have to play football to relate to the adversities in the book. And there were some big time publishers that wanted people's names named. And I just said, you know, that's not my motive to do that. And they're like, well, it'll sell better. And I'm like, well, if I, I mean, there's other ways to make money that are a lot better than writing a book. Mandrich has done countless speeches to aspiring athletes about the dangers of steroids and other learnings from his experiences. He also has a podcast coming out in September 2020 with a goal to inspire his listeners. The podcast is called One Man's Ethos by, uh, by Tony Mandrich or the Tony Mandrich podcast. And it's basically, um, it's almost kind of like Joe Rogan style of, it's like, I want to talk to people that are outliers, um, people that do phenomenal things. They don't have to be known, you know, just people that have overcome stuff or people that just do phenomenal things or their cause is incredible or, or something that'll impact people's lives uh, in a positive way. The main goal in life now is, and you know, and it's probably gonna sound cheesy is, but it really is to be of service to people. And when I say that, I mean, you know, to carry the message of, of hope and to carry the message of sobriety, you know, specifically in, in, in my case, but also to carry the message of, you don't have to be, you don't have to have a problem with chemicals to overcome adversity. Cause I've had a lot of problems in sobriety that had nothing to do with, it was just the way the thinking process we asked Mandrich if he could wave a magic wand and change anything about his life. Would he take the opportunity? He had this to say. I'm a believer of, of it had to happen to, you know, make those mistakes to learn those lessons kind of thing. So I don't regret it. Um, I, I would definitely not recommend it today to anybody. Um, I've done many, many talks over the last, you know, years, many years about, you know, uh, not, you know, don't go the steroid route. Here are the red flags. Don't get peer pressured and all this stuff. It's dangerous. It's, it's really, really dangerous uh, psychologically. Um, and people don't think about that. They think about more the physical. And I did it and I don't regret it. Um, I, you know, I like who I am today. And a lot of that is because of the mistakes that I had made, the pain I had to go through. And then to overcome that, uh, those mini adversities and some of them major adversities. And, and I still have a lot of learning to do. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that we all do. We all have learning to do. You know, if I keep making the same mistake and keep getting the same pain and doing the same things, well, then I'm just a dummy. Mandridge said this when asked to look back on a life with many highs and lows. When that miracle happened of sobriety, I thought going into that treatment center, yeah, I'm going to get sober. I'm going to clean it up and I'll just live a boring average life. But that's better than living a miserable drunk life. Little did I know that the best years of my life were ahead of me. And, and laughter started at day 11 when I was still in treatment. And, you know, there's been laughter in every day in my sobriety in the you know, last 25 years, even in the tragic days of divorce, of losing my mom, of losing loved ones, um, of pain, regret, um, of, there's always been a moment or moments in, in a day where I could laugh, whether it was laughing at myself or, or something in life and trying not to take myself too seriously, but also being there 
you know, consciously and cognitively to understand and experience what I'm experiencing, whether it's a hardship or something great. That is our story of Tony Mandrich, NFL veteran, recovered addict, and a person trying to make a positive difference with each new day. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Beat the Odds and can find some inspiration and motivation in the career and journey of Tony Mandrich. If you did, please rate and comment on our show, and please subscribe to our channel. You don't want to miss our next amazing episode. We want to extend a special thanks to John Sterling for connecting us with Tony Mandrich for this episode. Be sure to check out the other inspiring stories of professional athletes in this series. Beat the Odds is a production of Beyond the Game Media. I'm your host, Brian Zwerner. Bo Johnson is our sound engineer. Thank you for listening.